Let's turn to uh, Genesis 39. Genesis 39, we will read the whole chapter. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of the Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he did. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he did in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was a handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and he had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, This is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Now let's take our hymnals. Turning toward the back, page 896, where we will consider the last Lord's Day of the Heidelberg Catechism. So, Lord's Day 52, beginning with question 127, and this is going to be our our main uh, question of consideration tonight. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil means. I'm sorry. What does the sixth petition mean? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil means. We are so weak that we cannot stand on our own for a moment. And our sworn enemies 
the devil, the world, and our own flesh never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we may not be defeated in this spiritual fight, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. How do you conclude this prayer? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This means we have made all these petitions of you because as our all-powerful king, you are both willing and able to give us all that is good. And because your holy name and not we ourselves should receive all the praise forever. What does that little word, Amen, express? Amen means, this shall truly and surely be, for it is much more certain that God has heard my prayer than I feel in my heart that I desire such things from Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask You to... Be with us tonight as we consider your word. Help us to stay focused. Uh, Some of us come here, Lord, feeling drowsy, feeling worried or anxious. I pray, Lord, that you wake us up, set aside anything that may distract us so that we may consider your word closely and find comfort through it. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our catechism, it breaks the Lord's Prayer down into eight parts. Along with an introduction and a conclusion, there are six petitions. Uh, these are requests that we make of our faithful God and Father, which see to our physical and spiritual good. So first, we pray that His name would be hallowed, that it would be exalted and set apart. We also pray that His kingdom would come, that the gates of Hell would not prevail against the church of Christ and that his eschatological glory would be manifest, that the not yet would become already. In the third petition, we ask that God, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven and that our own will would be in conformity to his. Fourth, we ask God to give us our daily bread to provide for what we need in this life so that we may understand that every good and perfect gift comes from him. And fifth, we ask that God would forgive us our debts. Every day we fall short of God's glory. Moment by moment we sin against God's commandments. But in Christ we have the forgiveness of sins. And tonight we consider the sixth and final petition, which we find in Matthew 6.13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now you'll notice that while in the fifth petition we ask God to forgive us our sins, we are now asking God to equip us from refraining, to equip us to refrain from committing those sins. In other words, while the fifth petition uh, speaks about our justification, this sixth petition speaks now about our sanctification. So you'll notice that there's a fittingness to how this prayer is structured. We would expect, you know, logically, that temptation, the prayer to lead us not to temptation, would precede the prayer of forgiveness. That seems logical, that we would ask God uh, to aid us in, in our moments of temptation, and then when we do sin, then he would forgive us of our sins. But the way that Jesus has structured this prayer, it's actually flipped. He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, And that helps us to realize that justification comes before sanctification. uh, uh, Our prayer for God to forgive us our debts is a a prayer and an acknowledgement that in Christ alone, through faith alone, there is justification for us. But then we go on in the sixth petition to to, to request of God, to ask Him to aid us to fight against sin and to pursue holiness, to sanctify us. For God to conform us to his law as we live in the newness of life in Christ. But even while we have received the marvelous grace of God's forgiveness and reconciliation, we still continue to face the temptation to sin. And if you feel like you you don't really struggle with temptation, 
that you no longer face sin's tempting lure, while of all people, you are actually the most who is in danger. If you believe that you are no longer tempted, then you might as well say that you no longer sin. But John tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And James chapter 1, it says that the temptation is the root of sin. He says each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Therefore, since you continue to sin, you also continue to face temptation. So if you think that you no longer face temptation, that just means that you are no longer aware of temptation. That means that you have, you might, this might mean that you've become so completely enslaved to that sin that you no longer are aware of even, on the one hand, committing it, and on the other hand, being tempted by it. What's the answer to this? I mean, how can we know whether we're tempted and continue to commit sins if we're unaware that we're tempted by that particular sin? It seems like a dilemma. But this is a call for um, reflection, for self-awareness. We have to examine ourselves, see what sins we have been committing and where those sins are coming from. We must turn to our friends or family or our spouses to help us to recognize our sins. I can tell you that when I ask my wife or my kids, you know, what areas have I been failing in? Where am I been sinning? They can give you a nice long list pointing out my shortcomings, and there are many. But most importantly, we have to turn to God and ask Him to aid us, to reveal to us our sins and our temptations. And when you do that, the Spirit of Truth will reveal them to you and convict you of your sins. So even though we have the forgiveness of sins, we must continue in our fight against sin. After all, in Romans 6, Paul admonishes us, how can we who have died to sin still live in it? We know that our old self was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. When you became a Christian, there was a declaration of war. You must make war against sin. John Owen put it best when he said, Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. This is war. Their sin and temptation, it's not neutral ground. This isn't that no man's land between the two fronts. You are, you are face to face in a battle. And you have to fight against sin and temptation. Paul says that when we fall into temptation, we fall into a snare. Into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So, what are the temptations that you face today? And what are you doing about it? Everyone faces temptation, whether it's lust or it's greed or unrighteous anger or laziness. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So, the question is when you do face temptation. What do you do about it? Do you entertain thoughts of committing those sins? Do you in, indulge in your sin? Or do you, do you resist it? What is your attitude toward your sin and temptation? Do you welcome it and find some sense of happiness through it? Even to the point where you can't wait until you do it again? Entertaining those thoughts? Oh, just give me a moment, and I'm going to do fill in the blank. What is your attitude toward your sin? Now, when Augustine, that uh, bishop of Hippo, you know, the great Augustine we love, when he was a young man, he recognized the horror of sin, and yet he still delighted in it. 
In his confessions, he recounts how one time he and his friends stole pears. Not for themselves. They ended up feeding those, pa- those pears to pigs. Instead, they stole those pears simply for the pleasure of the theft itself. Kids, you ever do something like that? Do something wrong just because it's wrong? Well, this is what Augustine says. I had no motive for my wickedness except wickedness itself. It was foul and I loved it. I loved the self-destruction. I loved my fall. Not the object for which I had fallen, but my fall itself. My depraved soul leaped down from your firmament to ruin. I was seeking not to gain anything by shameful means, but shame for its own sake. He was desiring and loving that sin for its own sake. Recognizing his sin for what it was and yet still loving it, he eventually prayed to God, grant me purity and self-control, but not yet. Now is that your prayer? O Lord, grant me release from this sin. Give me victory over my sin and my temptation, but not yet. Have you come to love your own sin like Augustine did? Is that not what so many of us do? Arranging our life circumstances so that we can have the opportunity to indulge in that sin? That secret sin that we have come to love and and find so much enjoyment in? I mean, we convince ourselves. It's not that harmful. It's not that bad. I can't help it. I'm just so stressed, and there's just so much going on in life. How do you convince yourself to indulge in that sin? What is your attitude toward your sin? Are you numb to it? No longer aware of its power and destruction? No longer pricked in conscience that you've done a heinous thing? That you've sinned against a holy God? Have you become indifferent to it? Whether you do it or not, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is whether it's convenient or helpful for you. Or do you despair over your sin? Feeling like you are enslaved to it and yet you can't help yourself. Stuck in a constant and vicious circle of committing that sin. Which then is followed by shame and regret and then on to hopelessness since it seems to rule over you, finally just giving up and resigning yourself to it? Or do you hate that sin and fight against it with all of your might, finding strategies to overcome it, enlisting brothers or sisters in the church to help you fight the good fight? And even when you have stumbled into it, nevertheless, you recommit yourself to that fight, praying to God, forgive me of my debts, And lead me, not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. What is your attitude toward your sin? And wherever you currently find yourself, whether it's an indifference, whether it's in despair, whether it's in hope, I admonish you in the name of the triune God, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Call upon the name of the Lord. Pray to your God and Father. Ask Him to deliver you from evil. Call on Him to lead you not into temptation and to preserve you in the the face of sin's enticements. Jesus said that even though the Spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Therefore, He says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. But now you might just be wondering, why must I pray that God would not lead me into temptation? After all, doesn't James say, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. That's what James says. So if God doesn't tempt anyone, Why do we ask God 
that he would not lead us into temptation. Well, to lead into temptation is not the same as tempting itself. God does not directly tempt us to sin. If he did, then he would be, he would be willing somebody to sin, which is impossible since God is perfectly holy and is by his very nature opposed to sin. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God cannot will anything that is contrary to himself. Therefore, he cannot and does not tempt anyone to sin. But God is sovereign. That's one of our favorite words as Calvinists, isn't it? God is sovereign. Before creation, God had ordained all that would come to pass. And in his perfect plan of redemption, he also took into account everything that you and I would do, including our sins. And he has also shaped our life circumstances in such a way that he allows us to be tempted, as the Catechism puts it, by the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world opposes us because it is the fallen system of human corruption that views itself, and not God, as the be-all and end-all of creation. And just as it hated Christ, so also does it hate those of us who are of Christ, and not of, the, and not of the world. And Satan opposes us because he hates God, and by extension he hates all of us who, through our baptism, bear his name. He does everything that he can to lead us astray. He has gathered his whole demonic host to tarnish God's name and to get you to deny in, the, in, in God's promises as he tries to destroy you and God's people. Spiritual warfare is real. One of those things we sometimes forget about. Ephesians 6 exists where Paul tells us to guard ourselves, to put on the whole armor of God against Satan and against sin. The devil is targeting you, trying to get you to break God's law, trying to get you to deny God, trying to get you to deny God's promises, trying to get you to doubt in your salvation. But as it turns out, as great as our enemies are, the, the world and, and Satan, as great as they are, our greatest enemy is ourselves. It's ourselves. Because as James puts it, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire to sin is our own. Temptation comes from the heart. Satan and the world will only appeal to what's already in the heart to those things that frequently and often tempt you. Even Paul, the Apostle Paul, that hero of the faith says, Nothing good dwells in me, for I desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. <clears throat> o wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So even though we are no longer under the condemnation of God's law, the corruption of sin still clings to us, tempting us, luring us, and enticing us so that we would continue to sin. And so those are our great enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They use all of their ingenuity, all of their guile, all of their ability, all of their resources to make us become like them rather than like Christ. To tempt us and to lead us into sin. They will speak sweet words, promise you the good life, hold out happiness just as long as you give in to those sinful desires. But they are just as content to use the stick as the carrot. When we overcome temptation, when their attempts fail, they will lash out against us. Just consider what we read about in the life of Joseph. After having been sold by his own brothers into slavery, he ends up at Potiphar's house. And he remains faithful to God. Even in the midst of all the struggles, imagine being sold by your own brothers. 
and then being, being sold into slavery to this man. He ends up in this house, he remains faithful to God, and God <coughs> makes him succeed in everything. Well, while at Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife does all that she can to seduce Joseph and to get him to sleep with her. And what does he do? He flees from her. She frames him, and he is put into prison. These are the ways that the world, the flesh, and the devil will seek to overthrow us. Promise blessing, and when we resist, we are beaten. Our reputations are tarnished. Our livelihoods are threatened. And as we endure the world's wrath and are reduced to poverty and squalor, Satan comes up to us again, trying to convince us to follow him. And he whispers in your ear, God doesn't love you. If he did, then why would he let you suffer for following him? It's so much easier to follow the flesh, to follow the world, to follow Satan. Satan, he tells you, see, this is what happens when you live in holiness. You suffer. If you're going to suffer, well, you might as well just do that one sin. At least then you wouldn't be suffering. It's these times of difficulties where we must be especially on guard against these enemies. When we are suffering, when we are hungry and tired, when we are in need, sin seems all the more enticing But it's especially then, beloved, that we must ask God to help us, to aid us. But then we just might be asking, well, why does God do this? Why does he allow us to be tempted and to face these hardships? Is he a bully? Is he torturing me for his own sick and twisted pleasure? Well, I found the Westminster Confession of Faith to be especially helpful here. Under its article on providence, uh, it says this, The most wise, righteous, and gracious God does oftentimes leave for a season his own children to manifold temptations and the corruption of their own hearts in order to chastise them for their former sins and to discover unto them the hidden strength of corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts, that they may be humbled and to raise them to a more close and constant dependence for their support upon himself, and to make them more watchful against all future occasions of sin and for sundry other just and holy ends. God allows us to be tempted in order to bring to our awareness our former sins, those sins that we once committed in the past. And he does this in order to discipline us for those sins. As a good father, he disciplines us. He allows us to be tempted in order for us to recognize the extent of our corruption, of how great our sinfulness is so that we may be humbled, and in order that we may be on guard against future sin and temptation. And he also allows us to be tempted so that we may more and more depend upon him. Any good that we do, whether it's resisting sin or whether it's loving God, or our neighbor, any good that we do, we do by God's grace. It's only in and through Him that we overcome temptation. It's only by His grace that we mortify the flesh and live in holiness. Jonathan Edwards, in his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, likens mankind to a spider that dangles by its web over the flames of hell, which God is holding. And God could at any time let that web go, and that spider would fall. I agree with Edwards that at every point in our lives, we depend upon God's grace. He keeps us from falling by his grace. But we should see this more like a father who helps his child to walk by holding his hands. Parents, you know what this is like? You are helping your little one learn to walk and you're standing behind them and holding those little hands, letting, guiding them and holding them up as they walk. Well, sometimes, you know, we, we let go of their hands so that they can start 
learning how to walk by themselves. They stumble and they fall. And they do this so that they can learn from their mistakes when they are walking. They do this so they can learn what not to do and what, how they should uh, do better in the future. And it's pretty similar for us, right? We, we learn in the ways when we fall, when we, when we feel uh, God's discipline over us. It's painful at the time, but it's for our good so that we recognize that's not the way to live and so that we also recognize that uh, there's a better way to live. But just as the child who falls is also taught that they must rely upon their parents and that their parents are always there to pick them up when they fall. When God allows us to, to fall, whether it's in temptation or whether it's through suffering, we also learn in those times that it's God who is there who picks us up. God is always there to pick us up and that it is God who is there holding our hands and that we can only ever walk in this life as long as he continues to hold us up. Our catechism puts it in question 127, we are so weak that we cannot stand on our own for a moment. And so we pray, Lord, uphold us and make us strong by the power of your Holy Spirit. So we see that God is sovereign, but we also see that God is faithful. It's by his wisdom and sovereignty that he has arranged our life circumstances in such a way that we may face temptation. And sometimes we will fall. But he does this so that we may depend upon him as our faithful father and turn to him so that he will aid us. But this same God who is in control of all things, he never lets us face those temptations as those without hope. Because he has not only arranged those situations so that we may be tempted, but he has also shaped these circumstances so that we will always have a way of escape. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God never lets us be tempted beyond what we can handle. He always provides a way of escape for us. And sometimes that way of escape will be painful. Sometimes... By resisting sin and temptation, we will suffer, just like Joseph did. But we can have confidence that God will work all these things together for our good. When God delivered Joseph from prison, Joseph eventually became one of the most powerful men in the world. And he also eventually came to face his brothers, who had sold him into slavery. His brothers asked him for his forgiveness, and Joseph's words to them our comfort to us who suffer unjustly for doing uh, what's right in this world, for obeying God's law. Joseph said to them, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God is faithful. He will provide for us when we suffer for the faith, not necessarily in ways that we might hope for, but it will always be in ways that is for our good. God is faithful. He will provide for us when we face temptation. He will provide a way of escape for us. But our greatest source and strength in the face of temptation is found in the fact that this faithful God and Father has also provided for us His own Son. After His baptism, Jesus was led away by the Spirit into the wilderness in order to be tempted by Satan. And Satan came against him three times, and each time Jesus overcame all of Satan's temptations, not simply to provide an example for us, but chiefly because he did it for us in our place, so that we too, in him, can overcome temptation. Through faith we are joined to Christ, who is our life, when we face temptation, we have in Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit the power to overcome because Jesus overcame. 
And Jesus, He also prayed to the Father for us. He said in John 17, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus prayed for you that you would withstand Satan's temptations. And he continues to intercede for us in heaven. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, the author of Hebrews says, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Since Christ himself suffered when tempted, he is able to help you when you are tempted. Christ knows what you are going through. He knows your struggle. He knows your failures. He knows how you feel, that you feel like you can never get past the sin. But when you once again face that temptation, Draw near to the throne of grace. You have free access to that throne of grace in Christ. Draw near to that throne of grace. Call upon the name of the Lord. Come to Him with boldness. That is a right you have as His child. Come to Him with boldness and pray to God for His mercy and His grace, for His strength. And when you do that, He will give it. Because God is faithful. He is faithful to His promises. He has promised you that when you call upon His name, He is there to give you aid, especially in the face of sin and temptation. He will provide for you a way of escape, and He will provide you His own power. The same power that raises the dead. The same power that created heaven and earth is the same power that God will give you to face temptation and overcome it because it's the power that is in Christ and is given to you by the Holy Spirit now it's possible that in a few hours here you will face temptation as the night progresses you may find yourself confronted by one or by all of our great enemies of the faith what will you do Will you overcome it? Of course, you can do that Joseph method, get up and get out, run away. You can perhaps turn to your accountability partner, or you can think of something maybe you read in a self-help book. These are all helpful things we can do. But whatever you do, do it in prayer. Because resisting temptation at the end of the day is not something that we muster up by our own strength, We depend upon the God who gives us the strength and who promises to aid us and who is faithful to his promises, who is faithful to you. And he has also given to you his son and his spirit. And if it's tonight or another night that you stumble and fall into sin, you are not without hope. That's what that fifth petition is for. Confess your sin, and he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And you have hope because he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. You're not perfect. In this life, you will never be perfect. In this life, even the holiest have only a small beginning. But we have the promise that when Christ returns, it is then that our sanctification will be complete and perfect. When he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And the struggle against the world, the flesh, and the devil will be complete. And your Lord and your God will say to you, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Amen. Heavenly Father, we we depend upon you, Lord, 
upon every step we take. Do not let our hands go, but hold us up. We cannot walk without you, Lord. Help us to see those times where we stumble as opportunities that you give to us to continue to fight harder against sin. Help us to become more sensitive to our sin and and the temptations we face. But also help us that when we do stumble, Lord, that we can call upon you and, and, and recognize that you are gracious to answer our call to you. That you will restore us with uh, restore us by your grace. You are a merciful God. Any moment, any, any breath we take, Lord, is a gracious gift you've given to us. Help us with every breath to fight against sin. It is a terrible, terrible thing that we face. Aid us in the fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We ask these things of you, knowing that as our faithful God and Father, you are willing and able to do these things for us, more willing to grant these things to us than we are to pray them. As we face our struggles, Lord, help us to pray to you. Prayer is one of those things that we forget about. We just struggle with our own ability. Help us, Lord. Humble us so that we may call upon you and have a a regular practice of calling upon you in, in any struggle we face whether it's physical or spiritual. And we pray this in the name of our faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.